My name is Sage Finuki Funes, and I would like to welcome you all, students, families, alumni, and friends, to the Pembroke Center's Family Weekend program, Hawks and Doves, What's Gender Got to Do With It, with Professors Rose McDermott and Suzanne Stewart-Steinberg. The Pembroke Center is home to Brown's Gender and Sexuality Studies concentration. I'm the leader of the departmental undergraduate group. So today's program is sponsored by the Pembroke Center Associates, a group of alumni, students, parents, and friends who support the Pembroke Center. The Pembroke Center plays a unique role at Brown. Founded in 1981, it was named in honor of the Pembroke College and Brown University and the women of Pembroke and its predecessor, the Women's College. The Pembroke Center is an interdisciplinary research center that fosters critical scholarship on questions of gender and difference, broadly defined in national and transnational contexts. In support of our research mission, the center offers faculty, postdoctoral, and student research fellowships, as well as research grants for Brown faculty and students doing innovative work in a wide range of disciplines. The center also supports the Christine Dunlap Farmham Archive and the Feminist Theory Archive that preserve the history of Brown and Rhode Island women and the intellectual history of feminist scholars. Um, there's more information on a table back there if you would like to look at that. And I invite you all to visit our website to learn more about our programs, our activities, and research. So before we get started with our program, um, I would like to ask you all to turn off your phones. <laughs> um, and now I'm going to introduce today's speakers. So Rose McDermott is a professor of political science and David and Marie Marie, Mary, Ma, Mariana Fisher University, Professor of International Relationship, Relations at Brown and a fellow in the American Academy of Arts and Science. She received her PhD in Political Science and MA in Experimental Social Psychology from Stanford University. She has taught at Cornell and the University of California, Santa Barbara, and was a visiting lecturer at Harvard and a fellow at the Radcliffe Center for Advanced Study and at the Stanford Center for advanced study in the behavioral sciences. She is the author of four books, a co-editor of two additional volumes, and author of over 100 academic articles across a wide variety of disciplines encompassing topics such as experimentation, emotion and decision making, and the biological and genetic basis of political, or political behavior. Um, Suzanne Stewart Steinberg is a professor of Italian studies and comparative literature and the director of the Pembroke Center. She is the author of Sublime Surrender, Male Masochism at the Fin... Fin de siècle. Fin de siècle. <laughs> the Pinocchio Effect on Making Italians, 1860 to 1930. An impi imp impious... Impious? Impious <laughs> fidelity, Anna Freud, psychoanalysis and politics. She is currently working on a manuscript on land reclamation in, the fas in fascist Italy. Professor Stuart Steinberg directs the Pembroke Center's multi-year research initiative, Thinking More Differently, a collaborative critical project. She is also the mother of Anna Steinberg, class of 2019. Thank you for joining us. We invite you to stay afterwards and enjoy some refreshments and conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Sage. <laughs> Oh, is, the, uh, is the mic on? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon and welcome to um, the Pembroke Center. Um, you're very brave to come out in this horrible uh, weather. Um, I hope we're all warm enough. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, the heat, unfortunately, is on in the building, and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, so uh, I would like to thank Ro my colleague, Rose McDermott, for coming and speaking to us about her work this afternoon. And the way this will work is I will give her a couple of questions and she will then answer them and expand on them um, in the ways that she would like. Um, and we'll do that until about 10 to, no, wait a minute, yes, 10 to 5, after which we will open up um, um, the discussion to the audience and take and and have a Q&A for about 20 minutes. After which, then, please join us for a reception that will be over here. Okay, so, um, 
Let me just start uh, just asking a little bit about your biography. So you, how long have you been at Brown, and where were you before that? Um, so I came to Brown in 2009. Um, I started my academic career at, at the same time and, and place as Suzanne, only we didn't know each other. It was at <laughs> Cornell. Um, so it's very embarrassing to realize that we were actually like a building apart and for many years. Um, so I was at Cornell for, I don't know, six or seven years. And then I moved to the University of California, Santa Barbara, which I admit has much better weather than here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was there for six years. And then I had a year at the Stanford Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences. And then I came here in 2009. Last year I had sabbatical and I was back at the Stanford Center for Advanced Study. And um, uh, then I'm back here. So I've been here since 2008, 2009 uh, in the political science department, although I do a lot of work in political psychology and increasingly a lot of work in behavior genetics my appointments in the political science department. So, well, that then uh, leads me to ask about your work. And um, so one distinctive feature, you know, the sort of the intersection of uh, different disciplines that you just mentioned uh, seems to mean that you are interested in the relationship between sex and violence. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, and maybe you could talk more about um, why you are thinking about this and in what ways you, your approach is quite specific and actually also quite provocative. Um, well, this, I guess the, the easiest way to tell the story is sort of chronologically. I was a graduate student at Stanford and I was extremely blessed to have an amazing dissertation advisor named Mr. Versky, who died in 1996. But he was a professor of psychology and along with Daniel Kahneman won the work for the Nobel in 2004 on prospect theory. And so I was really trained in a very particular kind of way of looking at information processing. I was very interested um, because of my generation growing up with kind of the freeze movement and being really afraid that we're all going to blow up and die in nuclear war. I was very interested in um, kind of issues of uh, weapons procurement and so on. And so when I came, I did my dissertation on risk taking um, and how people made uh, decisions about risk in American foreign policy, mostly looking at presidents. So when I got to Cornell, I decided to do a sequence of experiments looking at the way people processed information about um, ambiguity and uncertainty, which are actually slightly different concepts, in deciding to buy weapons. So I have these amazing undergraduate RAs, and I do this experiment. I put a lot of time and thought into it, and I run it. And about a third of the way through, a really remarkable young undergraduate uh, student of mine, Erica Frank, came in. She sat down, and she said, you know, the girls are really different than the boys. And I said, what do you mean? We all know there's no difference between boys and girls, right? And she's like, no, I, they're pretty different. But I was so. Um, uh, immune to that kind of thinking, that I hadn't even coded my subjects by gender. I hadn't even taken that information. It's like many years later when I started doing other experiments and I had a colleague who was all about political ideology and he's like, well, we'll go back to your old experiments and we'll look at that. And I'm like, yeah, we can't do that because I didn't care about political ideology, I didn't code for it. Um, and I was like that with gender. And I said, well, can we go back and figure it out? And she's like, oh yes, because it was all paper and pencil. She says, the girls always have smiley faces at the end of their sentences, and you know they put they dot their eyes with smiley faces. We can go back. We can do it by the handwriting. And I was skeptical. Um, we we then coded going forward, male and female. But up to that point, I was skeptical about what it was in the past. But when she brought it in the data and she showed me how she coded it, and I was extremely embarrassed to realize she was 100% right. You could absolutely tell by the handwriting. <laughs> um, and um, so we coded it, and all my brilliant hypotheses about uncertainty and ambiguity came to nothing. I mean, there was nothing that was significant, and every single thing I ran on gender was significant. And it sort of blew me out of the water, right? Because here I was, I had been trained by the best psychologists at Stanford to know that there are no differences between men and women. You know, the differences that exist, um, you know, to the, to the extent that there are differences that exist, women are better than men, and women have no power even though they're better to the extent that they're different because of the oppressive male patriarchy, and that was the end of the story, right? Like, that was the story I was trained in in graduate school, a story that um, somebody else I went to graduate school with at the time who became a very famous psychologist now refers to as our baby feminist model. And um, so that's, you know, that was the way I was trained, and so I didn't even think about coding gender. And I saw this data, and frankly, I just didn't believe it, right? And so 
I then ran a sequence of experiments to try to convince myself that this data was wrong. Only all the data that I found completely supported my wrong-headed notion. And over the course of 20 years, I've been deeply convinced by my data to make about a 180 degree shift in my understanding um, about the relationship between um, sex and violence. And so in those initial experiments, I didn't, you know, I wasn't looking for this, but in the sequential ones, I really wanted to actually interrogate a series of assumptions that I had been, you know, intellectually and academically raised with about how all these things are all socialized, right? It's just a social construct. And so I ran all the personality differences that would be expected to diverge if these were, if these behaviors were a consequence of social construction. And none of them ended up being significant. And so um, through the largesse of a colleague of mine who was at Harvard, we got a pretty large grant from the Department of Defense that was very interested in why they couldn't get women to share food in special forces training. And we proceeded to do another sequence of experiments at Harvard that were much more sophisticated and you know, involved computer um, gaming and so on, um, where we started looking at biological underpinnings, and in particular testosterone, because that was his idea about what was really driving the difference. And again, it was one of these really interesting and striking things where I went in with a series of assumptions that ended up not being true, so that there were differences in testosterone between men and women, but they, it wasn't what was driving the difference between, you know, within men and the difference between, you know, within women. And so that was really confusing to me. I was really struck by that, and I couldn't explain uh, all my data, because I had all this data that said, well, it's something about being male and something about being female. I had a bunch of other data that said, well, it's not testosterone, and so that's how I went down the rabbit hole of genetics. Um, so, you know, some number of years later, now the majority of my work is actually on the genetic underpinning of uh, political and social behaviors, especially aggression. So, say more about that. Um, and yeah, so the gene that I started studying back in the days when you could actually do single nucleotide protein studies and get them published, you can't do that anymore because stuff is a lot more sophisticated. But um, is a gene called monoamine oxidase, and it's, there's a variant on this particular gene that in many, many populations um, has been shown to be associated with an increased risk of um, physical aggression. Not verbal aggression, but physical aggression. Um, it's much more common, it's, it's actually an X-linked chromosome, so it's much more common to get this variant in men than women because it's a recessive gene, and women have two copies of this gene, and men have in two copies of the chromosome because it's X-linked, and you know, men have one, which means that if you just have one version, you're much more susceptible to um, engaging in physical aggression. There's a series of studies out of a Dutch family that lacks this particular kind of um, uh, gene that is known for, you know, across 400 years of, you know, setting fires and murdering people. And I mean, it's, it's a really well-known gene. So that was the one that we studied in the initial work that we did on. Um, uh, we took saliva swabs from people, ran, this was actually the original work was done in Santa Barbara, uh, took saliva swabs from people, ran um, genetic analyses on them and looked at um, certain kinds of behavior in computerized games where they um, would have an opportunity to punish somebody and they could pay to punish, they could pay to be punished, uh, and so on. And what was important about that work is that I think it's really easy in a lot of these kinds of studies to assume that everything is genetic. And so a lot of the criticisms are like, well, you're saying that this is predetermined. And absolutely that's not the case. And um, so this, um, gene in particular, but other very complex pathways get turned on by environmental factors and by things that happen to you, and in particular, things that happen to you as a kid. So there's standard scales you use um, for traumatic early childhood events, um, and the more you have of them, and um, depending on what age they are, they're much more likely to trigger the expression of this gene, so it makes you more likely to engage in physical aggression. It matters when it happens, so happening at puberty is much more uh, traumatic than happening at other periods of time. Zero to five also really matters, but 11 to 15 is that age where it really sets things down a different pathway, and it sets things down a different pathway for life. Um, and these traumatic events are not like getting a parking ticket, right? It's like having a parent incarcerated, having a parent die, have a sibling die. You yourself is in the hospital for you know, years at a time. I mean, it's very serious things. But the more of those you have and the time at which you have them really increases your um, susceptibility, uh, especially if you have this particular um, genetic um, polymorphism for engaging in physical aggression. Now, that said, I really want to go back and say that 
environment can really trump genetics, just as genetics can trump environment, right? And so, um, some number of years later, after this, after I did this study, and the study was somewhat prominent at the time, um, National Geographic came to me and they said, we want to do a special on this, you know, gene, and we are going to call it Born to Rage, and, you know, they didn't say this, but they're like, it's going to be really awful and really salacious, and, you know, you're really going to want to do this, right? And I'm like, yeah, thanks, no, I don't want to do it. And um, they said, no, 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 we really want you to do it. And I'm like, well, I'm really glad you want me to do it, but I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, well, you don't understand. We put out an ad in the LA Times, and we said, you guys can be on TV uh, if you come and um, uh, give us your, you know, genetic samples. And uh, if you fall in the propensity of the genetic profile we want, we'll put you on TV. And if you agree to do this, we'll give you all that data. I said, OK, I'll be very happy to do that study. <laughs> So these were people in LA who had signed away their DNA for the small to non-existent prospect of being on TV because it's, you know, LA. Um, and I got that data. And so I was then able to contact all those people and have really extensive life history interviews with them. And so talk to them about what they had done in their life. And I knew what their genetic profile was. They, some of them knew what it was. Some of them didn't know what it was. Um, and it was a really interesting group of people because it was LA. So I had a bunch of pacifist, celibate Buddhist monks. I had professional mixed martial arts um, fighters. I had Harley Davidson, you know, biker gang guys. I had actors, famous actors, uh, famous producers, academics at big places, you know, UCLA, uh, USC, and um, a bunch of gang members who had just gotten out of jail uh, in LA for a murder, who were by far the most interesting and articulate about their experience, actually. Um, and what was interesting is, is people could make decisions to overcome their genetic history. So every single one of my pacifist, celibate, Buddhist monks had the genetic propensity to engage in aggression. And they were conscious of it. They said, I know that I can get triggered like that, and I don't like that about myself. And I'm going to spend my life meditating to overcome this propensity, right? Not a single one of the professional mixed martial arts people who made their living doing this had the genetic propensity. And they said, well, of course not. If I can't control my emotions, I'm not going to win my fight. Right? I can't win my fights because um, the people who lose are the people who are slaves to their emotions. And I'm not slaves to my emotions. And so there wasn't a direct relationship between their genetic propensity and you know, their life course. And so it's really important um, for me in communicating these things because I see it done incorrectly in the mass media all the time that you know, it's not all genetics. It's not all environment. We are the only species capable of overcoming our own evolutionary history and changing the outcome of this. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have propensities. And you know, over the course of 15 years, I've convinced myself that the most fundamental of that propensity is sex. It just drives a lot of stuff. So how would you think about um, the difference between sex, sexuality, and gender? Right? I mean, these are the three terms that at the, the Pembroke Center which talks about a great deal. And, uh, and generally speaking, um, uh, gender is viewed to be uh, constructive. Oh, yeah, not just environment, I mean, it's broader than just being determined by the environment, but, but it's a construction. Absolutely. Okay. And um, this is one of those really hard and messy places because people get really upset and um, end up hating you, and that's fine. Um, so, the way that I've come to understand it, and there's some disagreement about this, is I really see sex as a biological thing. Like you run someone's chromosome, they have an XX, they're an XY, they're an XXY, whatever it is that they are. Um, but the gender is the social construct that's built on that foundation. Many times it aligns, sometimes it doesn't align. Um, those things are independent constructs, they're orthogonal, they can be understood and analyzed orthogonally. I see both those things as independent of sexuality, which I think of as a very complicated uh, gene environment, uh, social developmental characteristic that, in my view, is also highly influenced by the in utero hormonal bath of gestation when children are um, you know, in utero. Uh, and I think that there's some good evidence um, around androgen baths and how that affects the development of sexuality. It's not the whole story. It's part of the story. It's probably more of the story in um, genetic males. Um, and so there, it's complicated. I say, I'd say that the most and strongest pushback I get on all the work I do is from feminists who don't want to believe that there's any biological underpinning of 
uh, any of the behavioral characteristics that I examine. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's a common position. It's one that I don't think is correct, but you know, reasonable people disagree on it. Uh, you know, um, what about then thinking of the difference between sex, as in the you know biological sex, male, female, whatever it might mm -hmm. be, and sexuality? And because I don't think they're the same. No. Right. And and so, and and the reason I'm asking about the sexuality question is because. The term is connected, I believe, to something we would want to call a drive, right? Oh. And the reason I'm going in that direction of the drive is because of the question of aggression. Oh, I see. Right. So um, uh, now I really appreciate your um, probably quite seminal work on Anna Freud, because this is the um, you know the original Freudian constructions of drives really were about sexuality and aggression. Absolutely. Right? That was his original thing. And then later he had the death drive to try and explain why people throw themselves into machine gun fire in the First World War. Um, and I think that that drive notion came out, in my view, of a particular kind of social model at the time that was built on the Industrial Revolution, right? This notion that you, know, you pour fuel into a machine, machine does something, and then out comes, in Freud's case, neurosis, right? So you pour in libido, and what you get is neurosis. Um, I think that the drive piece um, over time by a lot of psychologists has come to be understood in broader terms than just aggression. So yes, aggression is definitely one of those things that's a component of it, as is sexuality, but we have drive toward all kinds of things, toward mm -hmm. emotional intimacy, toward uh, social contact, some people toward spirituality. I mean, we can think about many domains, hunger, thirst, you know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that... Um, you know, I'm not going to know this data as well as I should, but there's, you know, pretty good evidence that there's variance across people. So some people have stronger drives than others. That is not necessarily um, uh, aligned with sex. So it's not the case necessarily that males have a stronger drive for food than women do or something like that. Um, but I think it's easy for us to have some stereotypes around um, who has stronger drives around sexuality or, or uh, around aggression. You know, the thing that I've studied the most, as I mentioned, is aggression. And um, in that regard, we have some interesting data showing, well, I have some, co I should back up a minute. I have some colleagues who've looked at this with regard to um, support for interventionist foreign policy. So what kinds of people actually support going to war in the face of threat? Um, and they find, for example, that physically stronger men are much more likely to be um, supportive of interventionist foreign policy stronger being measured by bicep circumference and how much physical weight you can lift with your upper body. That's not true for women. Um, what's true for women is more beautiful women are much more likely to support uh, interventionist foreign policy. Um, usually oh. it's the, <laughs> and these are independently ranked. So it's not like, oh, I'm beautiful, I'm a 10. It's like somebody else saying you're a 10, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, this is, this is work that Aaron Sell has done. It's, it's really interesting because it comes out of an evolutionary model that talks about how um, when you can uh, confer costs or withhold benefits, it gives people more power, right? So conferring costs is I can punch you in the face. You know, withholding benefits is I'm really beautiful, but you can't look at me unless you do what I want. Um, or you can't have sex with me or whatever it is, you know, that, that's around those kinds of things. What's interesting in that work is that you can show people pictures of men from the shoulders up and with remarkable accuracy, 90% um, accuracy, people can relatively judge the physical strength of the men just by pictures of their face. So people know just by visual thing how strong other men in the environment are. And you can, and, and um, they can also do it out of voice. So you can tell with men, but not with women, how physically strong someone is from their voice. And what's remarkable about that study is they did it in eight languages. So you can tell it accurately. 75, 80% of people are completely accurate, even in languages they don't understand. So this is about tone of voice, right? It's not about the content of what you're saying. Um, People are really good, both men and women, although men are better at it, at judging the physical strength of other men, again, from these pictures. And you can do a similar, although slightly less accurate, thing about beauty in women because there's more cultural variance in assessments of beauty. But at the very high end, it's pretty universal. 
Um, and again, those women are much more likely to support very conservative um, uh, foreign policy positions, very interventionist foreign policy positions, um, and not the sort of, you know, international law, you know, diplomacy, things like that. So in the work that I've done, what we did is we actually had um, genetic samples, so families, twins, parents, siblings, children, um, and looked at um, both their, you know, genetic propensities along different kinds of characteristics, and then looked at their attitudes toward complex foreign policy decisions and complex moral decisions. The moral ones are things that you guys would have all heard of, you know, you're on a sinking boat, the boat is sinking, one person is dying, do you toss the person out of the boat to save everybody else in the boat, or is that not okay? Um, you know, you have two vaccines, you know one is going to save the population from this terrible disease, the other one, um, you know, is going to kill you should you, you know, use the vaccine on uh, one, you know, on two people, one of whom you know is going to die. I mean, those kinds of, the, the really famous one, of course, is the trolley one about do you push, um, and this is his words, not mine, the fat person over the, the trestle to stop the train and thus save the lives of five other people. Um, and this is um, Jonathan Haidt's work. Um, and when I questioned him and said, well, do you get the same results if you don't say the person is fat? He got mad at me, and so I'm, I doubt that it's true. Um, but he's <laughs> definitely a fat shamer. Um, and so, um, you know, these are very, very common complex moral decisions, but we also ask questions about um, foreign policy issues. So, um, should we bomb North Korea if they launch a nuclear strike? Should we bomb Iran if they develop nuclear weapons? Uh, should we invade, you know, Yemen if uh, they launch against us, which actually ended up just happening and we did do that. But, um, you know, those kinds of questions. And you can show a very clear alignment between um, uh, men who have higher degrees of physical aggression, both self-reported and genetic susceptibility, and endorsement of these kind of conservative uh, foreign policy positions, interventionist foreign policy positions, and what you'd call utilitarian calculus on moral decision making, like yes, give up the one life to save the five lives, or yes, give up the one life to save the, you know, uh, ten lives or whatever. And so you get that. Um, and again, it holds up much more strongly in men than in women, although you get some, some alignment as well in women. Um, and that, that piece actually um, just came out in aggressive behavior, and so um, that's the most um, uh, complicated I've done in terms of tracing genetics to specific foreign policy um, and moral choices. Well, now that you mentioned foreign policy, um, I was going to ask you um, about how you would, um, you know, your work on these genetic predispositions, how that, how, how that would play out in the political field. And, uh, and maybe just because we know there's a big question in the room, right? Uh, which is, you know, why maybe this time a, a woman will be elected president of the United States, and why has that not happened? Uh, and to what extent is the fact that she is a woman so important in this particular election? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think everyone in the room probably has their own answer to that question. Some similar and some different. Um, I think why it hasn't happened yet is, you know, there's multiple sufficient causation on that, right? There's many, many, many reasons why it hasn't happened. I think it isn't accidental um, that it's somebody who's tied to somebody who has been a prominent male politician, right? That's very common. You see that um, in other places in the world where a widow of somebody will come to power, um, and that's easier, at least as a, as a glass breaker, than somebody who's uh, never been in the political uh, realm. You see, so you know, Sonny Bono's wife, and you know, Corzano Kino. I mean, people who have these these past experiences. I think it would be much harder for somebody who, for example, hadn't been married to a previous president. Um, I think it's significant and meaningful because if she does get elected, it'll be the first time in history that three of the most powerful countries in the world will be ruled by women. Right? So you get. Theresa May in, in the um, UK, get Angela Merkel in Germany. I mean, obviously there's other important countries that aren't going to be um, ruled by women, but you're talking about a third of the GDP of the world that is being really ruled by women. That's a very, very different series of calculations. And whether or not that will change the outcome of domestic or foreign policy, you know, you can't predict, but you can speculate based on um, past 
studies that have been done on group behavior. And I think, you know, in the past we have examples of a lot of women who were prominent leaders who were very hard and conservative, right? I mean, you think about Margaret Thatcher or Indira Gandhi or Golda Meir, but they were one woman in an environment against all men. If, it's, if you start to actually change the constellation, uh, it changes. So in, when you look at group decision-making behavior, to have women's opinions matter in a group, it's one of two things. It's either a third of women in an area where women are understood to like know something, right? So education, you know, health, things that we think of as softer things. Um, but if you really want to have women make a difference in like a hard topic where you know the men don't agree, it has to be 50% plus one, right? And then there's this other whole dynamic that happens when you do it in people of reproductive age, which is that um, may, you know it's not going to happen so much among 70-year-olds, but um, you know, when you look at it in younger people, and you know, this would certainly work in you know, situations like Google or Apple or whatever, it's very interesting because if the men in the group find the women attractive, they become much more aggressive because they're competing for her attention. If they don't find her attractive, they totally throw her under the bus, they bond with each other, and they toss her out of the group. Um, and it's very consistent. We did these experiments at Harvard some number of years ago with Richard Wrangham, and I have to say it was really depressing. Um, <laughs> but very consistent, totally predictable. Um, and then the, the IRB shut us down saying, you can't ask people if they find each other attractive. That will upset them. I'm like, they're 17 years old. They're 18 years old. They're 19 years old. You think they don't know they're being evaluated for their attractiveness? <laughs> oh, no. They know they're being you know, evaluated for how brilliant they are. I'm like, yeah, well, you Harvard people can think what you want, but <laughs> that's not what's going on. Um, and so, you know, the, the subsequent parts of, of those studies, you know, ended up being done in the UK and elsewhere, not by me, but by other people as well. And so there's multiple dynamics that go on. But for me, what I'm really interested in seeing if she does become president is allocation of resources, right? So right now, the United States spends uh, about $600 billion a year on military uh, weapons. Um, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of the GDP. It's almost 4% of the GDP. So think about what happens if that money starts getting allocated to education or to healthcare or to some other aspect of society. Um, and obviously, the president alone doesn't make those decisions, but, you know, and it, it um, intersects with political ideology in some important and meaningful ways. But, um, you know, if you get three very, very powerful leaders who all make a decision that they're going to cooperate uh, in terms of, you know, military and foreign policy, that frees up a lot of resources to be reallocated elsewhere. Um, and you definitely see in the United States Senate, for example, that to the extent that we've been able to break the log jam and get bipartisan consensus and laws passed, it's been through the Women's Caucus. So women, you know, on the Republican and, and Democratic side joining together to put forward bills. And so oftentimes um, there's a way that cooperation happens um, in ways for the female legislators that's different than the male legislators, probably because a status competition isn't quite as salient. There's other competition going on, but the status competition isn't quite as salient. So, you know, you've um, mentioned uh, several times that uh, a, a, an important factor in, in the issue of war or aggression and conflict, other than sex, seems to also be attractiveness. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so I'm, 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 I'm wondering to what extent that doesn't overly influence your data. In other words, uh, that so so that it, it's in some sense attraction, which is the sort of the opposite of aggression almost, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, seems to be playing a really important role in all of this. And and um, and it's sort of come back to the three powerful women. Um, well, I'm thinking of you know Hillary Clinton and you know the whole pantsuit thing, which right. is really. Fascinating. Really fascinating. Um, There's an amazing. Angela Merkel doesn't come across to me as warm and fuzzy. Right. You know. uh, right. Opposite. Right. Um, so the couple things. The pantsuit thing is fascinating, and there's a really interesting article in Eon about how, how and why her pantsuits can't have pockets, and how powerful women who wear pantsuits can't ever have pockets because it's about a body envelope 
violation. It says, I can keep things secret. And, you know, I have things that, you know, there's, there's actually subconscious messages. I mean, I'm not sure I completely was convinced by it, but I have to say it hadn't occurred to me. And when I read it, I found it pretty convincing. And it wasn't even so much about keeping things secret. It was about fidelity, right? It's about how faithful you are to your constituency, your husband, your population. And you can't be faithful if you're hiding stuff in your pocket, right? Like, when was the last time you saw a man's suit without pockets? They don't exist, right? Like, maybe there's some European cuts or something. But in American, it just doesn't exist. You will never see a pocket on any of her pants. They just, she can't do it. Um, and um, uh, in fact, her favorite, um, you know, Ralph Lorenz, her, the guy who did all her pantsuits for the three, um, uh, debates and obviously she had to have an American designer and you know there's all these issues around that but um, his original designs had pockets and they got taken out you know mm -hmm. for these reasons and so I mean that that's that piece is really interesting to me about the pockets. The other thing is um, I think age has a lot to do with yeah. how these things intersect right and so like when we ran our original um, testosterone studies one of the things we found was that there were two s series of people in our group who were the most aggressive. The really young men and the really old women. Um, but what the really <laughs> old women, like, you know, your crotchety grandmother, right? But it was completely conditioned on whether or not they were taking hormone replacement. So if they were on estrogen, because we asked, we asked a whole series of questions about, because we, we actually had a whole other series of hypotheses about ovulation and so on. But so we knew things about what kind of hormones they were on. And if the women were on estrogen replacement therapy, they looked just like a 20-year-old woman, so, you know, very, very, very nice. But if they were sort of postmenopausal and weren't on estrogen, then they basically looked like a 17-year-old boy um, in terms of how aggressive they were. Um, and so I think that there's a piece when you think about Margaret Thatcher, Golda Meir, you know, that's the way I'm, you know, Condi, Condi Rice, that's kind of how I think about it. Um, and um, that doesn't mean that, now, and, and Hillary is really fascinating to me because um, when you study these things a lot, you can see um, how estrogen affects facial structure. I'm pretty sure she went off estrogen when she stopped, when she had that aneurysm. You see her face getting puffier, and there's different changes in her facial structure. When she started to run again, the face changed again. So I think she's back on estrogen, which is really unhealthy. Like if you, <laughs> if you go off estrogen when you're over 65 for more than a year and go back on it, that's a huge cardiovascular risk. I mean, so if you stay on it, it's fine. And if you go off of it and go back on it within a year, it's fine. But you're actually raising your risk the way that men who take testosterone after 65 raise their cardiovascular risk. It's, the male risk is higher. It's like 12%. Female risk is somewhat lower. But obviously, you know, if you want to be president, you can get doctors to do all kinds of things. Um, I'm not positive that's what's going on, but I bet a lot of my academic credibility on, like, watching her facial structure change. And so um, now that doesn't mean she's nice, nice, right? I'm not saying that. She's doing it for appearance reasons, I'm sure and also brain reasons and hair and you know, skin and all that kind of stuff. But um, it, it's just interesting to me because I do think that age intersects with these things and the issues around um, attractiveness and support for you know, um, interventionist foreign policy, those studies which weren't mine were done um, on people of reproductive age. So I haven't seen the extensions done on people that are, you know, so what do the figures say about the relationship between attractiveness and aggression? So um, it's not true for men, right? It's just true for women. Like for men, it's a physical strength thing. So for men, what you have is an association between increased physical strength and support for aggressive and interventionist foreign policy. In women, what you have is an association between attractiveness and support, higher levels of support for interventionist, foreign pol interventionist and aggressive foreign policy. It's not 100%, but that, that's what the correlation is. Uh, I haven't seen those studies done in older people. These were done in younger people. Um, and people tend to become more similar, like, right, so at age 50, you have much, sim much more similar uh, alignments of testosterone and estrogen in particular than you do before that. So men and women start to look much more similar along a number of dimensions around age 50. Um, and then it, you know, becomes more so over time. No, um, maybe we could, because we, it's such a big group, uh, um, maybe we can open up, would that be okay? Yeah, of course. Open up uh, to, to the audience. Um, and the way this is working, there are there mics? They're right here. Right. Okay, there are two of them. So if you want to ask a question, if you can just step up to the mic. Somebody's making.
I do know that they looked at the association between physical strength in women and these outcome measures and didn't find a significant relationship um, between how strong women were and whether or not they supported uh, interventionist foreign policy. That, that association, which is very strong for men, didn't exist for women. Um, I don't know that they looked at the relationship between attractiveness in men and outcomes. I don't think that they did, but I don't know. I can't remember. Okay, thank you. Does that? Well, it, it, I'm just, I guess I'm asking about this because it seems that um, attractiveness and fitness have some sort of relationship and that fitness for a man isn't just about upper body strength and fitness for a woman is certainly not all about strength either. So I was just wondering if there was some sort of more holistic measure that could have been used and could have been used on both genders. The um, attractiveness measure were pictures that were then rated by other people, that part I remember. Um, the relationship between fitness and attractiveness is definitely, especially in women, it's a Western cultural construct. So in many parts of the world, there's not an association that's as strong between fitness. In fact, in places where populations live at subsistence level and they're starving, um, being fat is really attractive because it's a sign of health and social status and genetic fitness. And so what, because it was an evolutionary, um, evolutionarily motivated um, study, they were looking for universals, and so they didn't want to necessarily make an assumption that there's always an association between fitness and attractiveness. And although that may be true in America or in Western contexts, it's not a universal thing you see around the world. Thank you. Yeah, it's not actually as close an association as you might think. I mean, definitely, when you look at physical fitness in terms of longevity and blood pressure and cholesterol and stuff, the healthiest state in the country is Hawaii, by far. Um, so, and that's because everybody's outside all the time, right? Like it's, you know, it's definitely a function of being active. But there's a lot of um, um, low education, um, low status, very healthy people in places um, in the West who are like farmers and hunters and stuff like that who are very strongly supportive of conservative foreign policies, but wouldn't necessarily be what you would call you know, the elite. Um, and I think that there's also really strong cultural um, norms around what's considered attractiveness. Like I live half the year in California and half the year here, and I've lived for periods of time in New York and in Boston, and what's considered attractive is totally different, like especially at the high end, right? So you know, um, I think of the East Coast as like really being about power and money and status. And California is all about like, you know, this natural, you know, wake up, perfect tan, perfect hair, hit at the beach, you know, all about sex and passion. It doesn't really matter if you have a job. It doesn't really matter if you went to school. It just matters that you're smoking hot. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the Midwest is really about freedom, right? It's really about getting married young, raising your family, having a particular kind of approach to community and, um, uh, faith and family that's, that's very differently oriented. I think that, that in each of those groups you get people who are very strong and very attractive and differ in both ideology and also uh, approaches to um, you know, foreign policy. But that in general, if you do the overall association around the world, not just in the United States, you get these very strong correlations between physical strength in men, conservative foreign policy, and attractiveness in women and conservative foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good question, and I, I'm not going to um, know the true answer, but I can give you my speculation. I think it's really political. So it's really driven by um, the politics of equality, right? So they want these opportunities to be available to women, but they don't want to force them on women who don't want to have them, right? So you don't want to say every woman has to serve in the military because there's a lot of women who don't want to do that. But you don't want to foreclose options to women because there's a lot of women who do want to have them. Um, one of the really interesting stories in this regard that I heard that surprised me had to do with um, putting women on submarines. So submarines are hard because they're really small spaces. And um, they've had a really difficult time um, getting enough people to sign up for submarines because it used to be the case that you'd get great submariners, 
because everybody would want to be a fighter pilot and then they couldn't be a fighter pilot because their eyes weren't good enough. But now that you have laser surgery, you can get enough people who have good eyes that people don't want to be on the submarines. So what ends up happening is there's a group of female Congress people who decide that it's really important to put women on submarines as a political statement. Um, and they pass the law over the women in the military who say this is a really bad idea. Um, and it's a really bad idea for a couple of reasons that they had seen from aircraft carriers. So what happens on aircraft carriers when you have a really long um, tour is that lot, there's some number of women who get pregnant. And a number of, and when you get pregnant, you get sent off the ship. So when that happens, there's a number of men who get very resentful. And they say, these women can get off the ship and we can't get off the ship, as though they had nothing to do with the pregnancy whatsoever. <laughs> um, and um, you know, telling them that, A, if you were sexually continent, this wouldn't happen, m doesn't make any you know, headway, but neither does the argument about um, you know, condom use. But whatever. Um, so they knew that this would be an issue, that you get this male resentment and issues with um, you know, women getting pregnant and so on. Submarines are much harder because submarines are hot bunked. And what hot bunked means is, because of space, every bed is used 24 hours a day. So everybody has a bed eight hours, but two other people share the bed with you. So you have the bed for eight hours, person two has the bed for eight hours, person three has the bed for eight hours. Which means that you're sleeping in somebody else's sheets for months at a time. Ugh. Okay, so, right. <laughs> so, um, I do a lot of work on smell, and I would tell you that there's issues with that. But um, I mean, smell and political ideology and mating, I don't mean like smelling bad. I mean like issues of attractiveness and so on. So what happens, they think that the problem's going to be that they are not going to get enough women to sign up. And it's hard to get women to sign up, but they can get some women to sign up. The problem is they lost some really high rate. I'm not going to remember off the top of my head, but it's like a third of the men re-up it. And the reason they don't re-up is their wives won't let them. Because they don't want them hot bunking with another woman. <laughs> right? They don't want that bed. And so then they did this whole thing, okay, well some hot beds, you know, some hot bunks will only be female hot bunks, some will only be male hot bunks. We're going to have female bathrooms, male bathrooms. The bathroom thing goes out the window, you know, day one. But the bunk thing is an issue. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of political issues around this that can't really get discussed. Um, the other thing that happens, you know, is you have these anti-fraternization laws, like you're not supposed to get sexually involved with somebody who, you know, you have command over and so on. But one of the things that they've found from watching the Israeli military, which is interesting, is that when you have men and women actually fighting in combat together, if men on a particular raid get killed, people don't like it and it fills them with vengeance and it actually makes them more aggressive and more likely to kill and fight the enemy. But if women in the group get killed, it paralyzes the group. It actually makes them not able to fight as well. Now, I can give you my speculation about why I think that's true. That has an evolutionary basis, but I don't have any facts to support it, so I'm you know, going to leave it aside. But that's one of the other concerns, right? Is like you have these issues that are complicated. It's not like integrating race in the military. Um, and so, as a result, what that means is that you end up in a situation where you want to leave the option open for women to serve if they want to serve, but you don't want to force women to serve in circumstances where they don't want to serve. You, you know, Suzanne clearly doesn't want to be a submariner. I'm shocked. Um, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want to be a submariner. You know, I mean, I'm not sure that addresses your question, but that's my that's my speculation. I don't have hard facts about what's driving it, but I think that that's what it is. Um, I was telegraphed about that. The first point about the pantsuits I think is interesting. I mean, I guess I think about it because um, I don't like to carry around a lot of like purses and bags and stuff like that, and I like to be able to put keys in pockets, and it's really hard to find that stuff. On the other hand, you're absolutely right. It makes your hips look fatter, and who wants to have hips that look fat, right? And so there's a lot of the issue about scrutiny over appearance that is clear, and that's made more salient by the discussion around attractiveness. Um, and um, 
you know, the, the correlation piece. So the way that the argument works, and you know, again, you don't have to buy the argument, but this is the way the argument works, is that when you can infer costs, when you can beat someone up unless, they want, unless you do what they want them to do, or um, withhold benefits, right? So if you're really beautiful, you can infer, be you know, you can confer benefits to somebody. If you're really strong, you can infer costs. And so the idea is that people who have higher status, either because you know, they're very strong or they're very beautiful, um, they're used to getting their way. And they're used to getting their way easily by forcing other people to do it. And so when they come into conflict, that's a very easy and typical and natural way for them to try to get other people to do what they want, is to basically force them through these strategies. Um, and that, that's, um, that carries over to the realm of not just interpersonal conflict resolution, right, but uh, conflict resolution in terms of foreign policy. And if you buy into the arguments that um, this French feminist, Sylvia Agasinski, she's actually Polish by extraction but lives in France now, makes, she talks about how all conflict resolution in the international realm is really a function of the lessons people learn in their families of origin. So if you grow up in a family of origin where your father beats up your mother, then when you have a conflict with somebody else, you think the right way to resolve that, that conflict is to beat somebody up, whether it's dropping bombs on them or, you know, um, engaging in some other kind of physical aggression. If you grow up in a household where there's negotiation between parents and between parents and children, you learn that that's the appropriate mechanism of conflict resolution. And so part of her argument is that if we really want to reduce conflict in, in the world, what we need to do is provide greater par parental support. We need to provide better support for maternal nutrition. We need to provide better um, you know, parental communication skills and family skills and so on so that people don't learn that that's the appropriate way of conflict resolution and grow up and then become a nation that thinks that the way to solve you know, conflict is to drop bombs. Um, so that's, you know, that's the kind of way that the argument both, you know, works both theoretically and, and also evolutionarily. Um, it's a really good question, and it's going to have a bit of a complicated answer um, for exactly the reasons that you say. Um, I don't think you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence. What you can show are um, relationships between how women vote and how men vote on particular issues. So you can look at, like, for example, the extent to which women will um, support certain foreign policy initiatives in polling and things like that. And in general, on average, what you get is women caring more about um, health and um, education and things like that, and less likely to support wars. What's interesting about it is it turns out to be a little more complicated. And I'm going to complexify it in two ways. One is that um, women, even when they don't fight themselves, often egg men on to fight for them. Right? It's not like they're just passive. So they're trying to you know, get men to do their fighting for them. Um, and so the difference that I see is really about uh, wars of offense versus wars of defense. So if you've been attacked, if it's 9-11, if it's Pearl Harbor, everybody's on board with fight, you know, fighting to protect yourself. Men, women, children, you know, like everybody. You look at World War II, everybody is growing vegetables in their garden. Everybody's buying bonds. Like everybody's on board. If you think about wars of offense, where we're going out and engaging in, you know, imperialist uh, aggression in the Philippines, or you know, where we're going to um, invade Iraq or invade Afghanistan, you get much bigger gender differences, where men are more supportive and women are not. I think part of the reason for that actually has to do with emotion. So, on average, women tend to be more fearful and men tend to be more angry. And angry people, male or female, are much more likely to believe that. Um, are much more optimistic in their assessment of their likelihood of victory. So they're much more likely to think, I can go kick that person's ass and I'm so going to win. Right? <laughs> um, and that's true of men and women if they're angry. It's also true if you're afraid, male or female, that if you're afraid, you're like, oh, I don't want to antagonize that person. They're going to come and really hurt me. And so I think that the, the alignment of predisposing emotion with um, gender can affect these kinds of um, choices about which sort of you know, war you're going to support, offense versus defense. Um, you know, the, the other way in which I think that um, these things can play out has to do with um, the children that women have and whether they're boys and how old they are. 
So if you have boys who are going to be drafted into war, you're much less supportive of that war because your son could go off and get killed. Now, if your boys are like three, four, or five years old, you may be a lot more supportive of that war because you want to make sure that your children are going to have a good life. If you have girls that are also of reproductive age, you may not support that war either because you know that her prospects of being able to find a good marriage partner diminish as the population of men that age die. Um, these things aren't conscious, but they happen. <laughs> so if you actually, like we did a bunch of studies in six different countries looking at attitudes toward gender inequality around a number of domains, and I threw the bit in about how many kids do you have, what their gender is, and what their age is, just as one of my typically wacky things, not expecting it to work, and it worked. Um, and so I'm, again, in the process of being convinced against my better instincts by the data that this stuff actually matters. It's a really good point, and it's a really subtle point. And unfortunately, in large studies, the best you can do is things like gauge how much education someone's had, like college versus high school or whatever. You don't always necessarily know their background. I can say that like, in some studies, the testosterone ones we did, um, we did at Harvard. They were mostly Harvard undergrads. They were really pretty well educated, and they had um, you know, um, a limited Set. So I feel like they know the history they know really well, they just don't know a lot of history, right? So they know, you know, what, 1945 to the present. Um, what happened in that study was a real exercise for me in um, serendipity, which was I, I um, designed that study for two years, and it was a whole study about um, fighting over oil rights. And we... Um, ended up starting the study the day the US invaded Iraq. So I was really screwed over the night before. I had to change two years of protocol development from a fight over oil to what became about conflict diamonds, which is stupid. But you know what happened was I knew that everyone reading it would think that it was really about the war. And it was not about the war, right? But there was no way they weren't going to think that. But I had a very hard time thinking of something that would be as compelling as oil. And the reason we picked the conflict diamonds was because it was like Leonardo DiCaprio had just come out in that movie about blood diamonds, you know? And so everybody was like really into blood diamonds. And so it seemed like the thing that we could do. But, um, you know, you, you end up with these, these conflicts. But I think that, you know, you're absolutely right. How much history people know deeply informs the choices that they make because the analogies that they bring to bear from the past affect their notion about what should be done in the future. If you think Vietnam was a disaster because you know, we should have had more troops in there, then that's going to change your vision of what you think we should do in Afghanistan than if you think Vietnam was a disaster because we shouldn't have been there to begin with for other political and social reasons. So I think that that's a really important and deep and subtle point. But we didn't have the opportunity to ask really detailed questions about their knowledge, which would have made a difference. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. We're not making a causal argument, right? We're showing the correlation between individual variants on, you know, genetic or environmental background and a series of attitudes that they have about foreign policy and about um, complex moral decision making. So we're not saying it's the cause, but we're showing this association. I would never want to simplify and say that this is the only thing that matters. On the other hand, I do believe that we can show a correlation where there's an influence. And these are really early days of these kinds of studies, right? And so we're trying to just begin um, the investigation, which will be built on by others over time. And you know, my best hope with all of my work is that somebody better will come along and overthrow it. But that you, know, you have to have a foundation. You get to the moon with the first step. And so some of my stuff will absolutely be overturned. And that's good. That's what I want. But I want to take the first step. And I want to show these correlations and not claim that they're causations, but think about then with subsequent studies, um, complexifying it by things like looking at degree of education or looking at other things that might interplay. In my case, I really think it's a lot about early childhood traumas and um, how that influences the development of attitudes over time in a very complex developmental path. So you're absolutely right. It's super complex. 
but in order to actually test things experimentally, you have to really simplify it and you have to bring it down and then you aggregate up over time across multiple experiments. And that's at least the way that, you know, I was trained to do that kind of, that kind of work. But you're absolutely right. It's not that simple. So it was all done on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, and again, it wasn't my study, but the study that was done um, was had people on the West Coast, um, you know, evaluating attractiveness of people on the West Coast, some of whom are from the East Coast, right? Um, but the studies that were done looking at physical strength and um, voice strength and so on, those were pictures of people from cultures all over the world. So the uh, Chamani, who are a hunter, horticulturalist group in Bolivia. The, you know, Hadza, who are a, a pastoralist group in Tanzania. Um, you know, eight, eight or nine different cultures. Um, but you would ask, what they did is they asked people in that culture to rank attractiveness. So it wasn't like somebody in Santa Barbara looking at pictures of the Chamani. Um, but um, at least that's my memory of how that study was done. So the ones on vocal pitch and physical strength and um, so on, those involved many cultures, but the ones about attractiveness, I think those were just done within a very limited culture because it was a lab study, not a, not a survey study. Thank you. But it's a good idea for a study. <laughs> you can run it. <laughs> you know, I would like to ask a, a follow-up question that came from, from just sort of the previous question, which, which has to do with the leap. And, um, and as you were talking, I, I remember quite a few years ago um, uh, a very noted psychologist uh, published a biography of Adolf Hitler in which she shows that um, his problems in life um, were caused by, by not, you know, neglect, motherly neglect. Right? Now, it, it, it seems to me that that can be perfectly true, right? but on the other hand, who cares, right? In other words, I mean, how do you, I mean, how do you make that, you know, I mean, it, it could even be causative, but, at a certain, but, but does it matter? You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, that would be, I guess, the question. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about motherly neglect is interesting, right? Because there's been this long history that for a long time it's been that you became schizophrenic because, you know, your mother was cold. And then it became clear that schizophrenia actually had this genetic basis. And the good part about that then is there's, you know, women don't have to feel guilty about causing schizophrenia in the way that they raise their children. And so, you know, it's no longer the cold refrigerator model of having a child, but it's, you know, the, the genetic uh, predisposition. And so I think that that does... Um, at least alleviate some suffering from people that think that there was something about their behavior that could have been different that would have, you know, ended in a different kind of outcome. Um, the question about does it matter, I think is really, um, you know, reflective of what level of analysis of science you want to study. And, um, you know, if you want to study big macro practice, practices, which are really important and can be studied from, you know, sociological standpoint and so on, you're not going to be as interested in these foundational things. But a lot of the foundational work in biology and so on that led to the development of antibiotics that saved you know, all of our lives multiple times comes from this kind of basic foundational science work. And so I think both of them can happen side by side to the benefit of both as long as they don't kind of ignore the other half of the equation. Um, I certainly would never say that these things are simple. There's not like a gene for anything, right? They're very um, complex um, hormonal, developmental, uh, neurochemical pathways. And uh, they aggregate to behavior that we care about. And so I think for me, you know, I went down this path just because I found it fascinating. Um, but I think that there's equally valid ways that you could study it from more macro perspectives if, you know, what you want to do is change the outcome, mm -hmm. you know, at a level of intervention. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can drill down from both sides, right? Um, and I'm not sure that's convincing, but that's the way I think about it. <laughs> well, I think on that note, uh, please uh, help me thank Rose McDermott.